Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It looks like we've got a pretty good crowd there um, going, which is great for a couple days before Christmas. So thank you for joining. This is a, a webinar, free complimentary webinar for serialization and uh, the U.S. the 2023 mandates. So we will go through those with you. This um, webinar is being co-hosted by both Life Scientific and HICOF. Let me tell you a little bit about Life Scientific. We're a manufacturer and a manufacturer rep. We've been in business since 1992, representing many manufacturers. We've done a whole bunch of jobs um, in, a, in a lot of different areas, pharmaceutical and, and um, kind of beyond the reaches of that as well. So if you guys have any projects beyond um, what we talk about today, high cough, just give us a call. We can uh, move forward with that. We'll show you a few of our other reps. You can get on our other manufacturers we rep. Um, Mike's got a, a fun little production through chart there for you that is also on our website that you can take a look at as well and let us know if you have any questions. So at the end of the session, we're going to have a question and answer session if, while during um, the webinar, you can pull up a chat box and you can type your question there. We are going to have you on mute so you I don't think we're going to open it up at the end for comments so you will just need to type your questions. There's going to be a whole bunch of question and answers, and then those will also be included on we are going to record this and have this um, for you to watch later as well. Great. Thanks, Mary Beth. Thank you. Um, yeah, Marco is going to be moderating, and so he'll go through all of the questions that come up. Please uh, don't be bashful. Ask whatever. We've got a very good subject matter expert uh, on. So, you know, if you were going to ask me, maybe it'd be a little questionable, but High cost uh, has been at it a long time. So thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, I'm still in my jammies, been a little sick. So that's why my camera is off. I wasn't anticipating everybody having cameras on, but so be it. Um, anyway, yeah, thank you so much for getting on to learn more about serialization, the DSCSA and our manufacturer High Cops related skill set. Um, within a couple of days of this webinar, uh, we will be editing the webinar a little bit just to make sure all the content's appropriate and I don't say anything inaccurate. Um, and then it'll be downloaded. Once it's downloaded, I will be putting together just a little follow-up email with some information um about high cough and so you can get in contact with us i think everybody that signed up we did capture your email i'll be sensitive of not overusing that um so again you know this video is going to be downloaded on our youtube channel so if you want to share the riveting content with any associates you're uh more than welcome to do so so today's webinar, we're going to be reviewing the FDA's Enhanced Drug Supply Chain Security Act implementation and readiness efforts for 2023. So one of the primary objectives of the FDA's efforts here is to identify illegitimate products and protect the integrity of the supply chain from counterfeits, diverted stolen, adulterated, fraudulent, or otherwise unfit product. There's certainly a lot of press about uh, products that are illegitimate, and right, rightfully so. These <clears throat> excuse me, fraudulent products create significant issues for our legitimate manufacturers and suppliers. They also pose a quite significant global health risk. By some estimates, up to 10% of all uh, pharmaceuticals in the global market are Ill illegitimate. That's a huge number. Counterfeiting is a huge criminal enterprise, and it's sized at upwards of 400 billion US. And a lot of internet pharmacies are dispensing significant amounts of bad product and our U.S. Board of Pharmacies have done a lot of investigations, more than 10,000 
of the 35,000 online pharmacies they've reviewed um, have some form of illegitimate product. So um, it's really a global issue. It's not just something that's restricted to developing, uh, developing countries. So implementing technologies to help reduce fraud risk can have a significant impact on this global issue. So uh, as Mary Beth had mentioned, we recently started representing high cost to help do our small part in addressing this issue. Today's presenter and serialization subject matter expert is our HICOF co-founder and CEO, Sasha Totley. Sasha got involved in this market um, as a consultant in 2010. He's still very much associated with Besto and is their CIO. Um, so Sasha's uh, internationally recognized. He's an authority on the topic and holds several related patents. Uh, as I would said before, please don't hesitate to chat any um, serious questions for the guy. I know he enjoys the challenge. So anyway, with that, I'll turn it over to Sasha. Thank you, Mary Beth and Mike for the introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to have uh, the opportunity to talk to all of you. It's uh, um, really great to have such a, uh, a long list of attendees uh, here on the on the call. Um, and uh, let's just jump into the topic. Um, you see, we are already since uh, a longer time on the market in this uh, specific field of track and trace and uh, product uh, safety or product security. Uh, we are globally active. Uh, we are based in Switzerland uh, with uh, also machinery being produced here. And we are mainly focusing on the pharmaceutical industry as uh, the Mike and, uh, and his team. And we are a family business basically in the second generation. Let me try. So here, just uh, it's always better to have an image uh, to get an impression. Uh, that's uh, my father on the top left, Sergei, who is uh, might some of you know as well. Uh, we have offices and production sites in Switzerland, as you can see on the image. And um, we are, um, as already quickly mentioned, uh, a manufacturer of machinery, as well as the required software for the full track and trace process. And that's kind of unique because there are plenty of uh, manufacturers of machinery out there, which are not so familiar with the required software. And there are a lot of software and um, experts out there which typically don't um, manufacture the machinery. And we are experts in both fields as we really in-house produce both products to the required level, which is um, out there requested by the, the pharmaceutical market. Um, as mentioned, we are having a global reach uh, headquarters in the United States and in all the blue countries, we have representatives and, um, and trained teams which can operate our equipment. Some of the customers or companies we have, we are working for, which use our equipment and software. Uh, you can see large names. You can see um, names, uh, let's say, original uh, manufacturers of uh, the original drugs, the so market authorization holders, as well as contract manufacturers um, from all parts of the world, and also some. Uh, manufacturers or companies outside of pharmaceuticals, but let's focus today on the pharmaceutical world. Coming to the main topic of uh, today's uh, presentation, which is the United States DSCSA update. Um, so some of you, or probably all of you, are uh, know that there is the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, um, actually already partly um, in, enforced, which is basically a law um, for the United States market, which requires more and more tracking of pharmaceutical product. 
Um, the next big or last step, um, which needs to be uh, performed by all manufacturers, is basically building or completing the electronic interoperable system to track and trace every prescription drug on the US market until the end of 2023, or at least have the systems in place to allow that. Um, the idea of the system in overall is to enhance the ability uh, to help and protect consumers from uh, exposure to illicit drugs, uh, counterfeits, contaminated drugs, other lawful product, something which uh, unfortunately, as Mike already said, is, is an issue as well in the United States. So going forward, um, I have put together some core, let's say, uh, um, specifics uh, of this law. So mainly the scope is on prescription drugs. So um, some other let's say medical groups are excluded, which is, for example, blood or blood components, um, radioactive drugs, imaging drugs, so everything which uh, um, is used in the CT scan, then um, medical gases, and some other groups are as well excluded. So the main topic of this law is all the prescription drugs which are out on the market. It's comparable to the requirements coming or are in other big markets as for example, the European Union, China, as well as uh, Russia and so on. The involved parties who are actually, let's say part of the, this legislation are the manufacturers, uh, which are required to apply the mark on every individual product. Then, of course, everybody else who is part of the supply chain, which is uh, which are the repackagers, the wholesalers, um, as well as uh, in the end more the dispensers like the pharmacies, and also the third-party logistics providers called 3PLs, or that's the abbreviation which I might use later in the presentation as well. What happened in the past or over the past uh, years? Um, as mentioned, the implementation or this, the law started to be enacted in 2013 and uh, over the years 2017 and 18, basically the application of the individual mark, um, which is uh, a bit uh, complicated wording for just the serial code which needed to be applied on every individual product, um, was one of the major steps in implementation. And um, now um, there were several years time until this last step, which is going to be, let's say, live at the end of 2023, um, which is basically uh, using all the data which can be applied uh, or which are actually gathered through these serial codes. And the goal or the requirement which needs to be fulfilled is in short that the manufacturers and trade partners need to have a fully interoperable electronic uh, system, which allows to track or trace every, you, every item on unit level um, at any time in the supply chain. As well, um, for anybody who is uh, getting hands on any sellable returns, they need to have the ability to verify the status of this individual product or drug uh, back with the manufacturer or somebody else in the supply chain. Um, to keep in mind, um, you will never see by the law that there is uh, aggregation required. Um, the aggregation, just in short, I will come back to that later in the presentation, is uh, basically the, the full hierarchy of, of individual items packed in shipping carton ABC. Um, so having this uh, digital, let's say, hierarchy of what is packed where um, in the database or in some IT system. So this aggregation is uh, by law not required, but to manage the requirements of the law, it's kind of required indirectly. Um, another uh, major requirement, which is uh, coming for the end of 2023, is uh, that a full electronic uh, interfacing capability is uh, required by all, um, let's say, parties of the supply chain. 
um, as in the end uh, request should be re answered within at maximum 24 hours. So what is needed to be marked, as already mentioned, the individual sales item, the SKU. Um, on the left side, you see it is uh, in form of uh, uh, um, a bottle or in this case, um, a folding box. It needs to be or is probably already 90, more than 90% of the cases marked with um, the following information. The GTIN, um, which is typically also containing the NDC, the National Drug Code of the United States. Um, the serial code, the batch number, the expiry date, and that is all mandated by D DSCSA. Now on the shipping carton, um, it's not really in directly required as already mentioned, but it's um, it's going to be indirectly required to have an aggregation in place, meaning that the shipping carton um, is going to require for full cartons uh, a GTIN with serial number. Um, so this uh, is basically a sales item in in view of the the, the FDA. And for partial cartons, they will require to uh, keep have a, um, a linear barcode in form of a GS1 SSCC, which is a serial shipping container code. Um, it's also kind of a, a serial number. Um, exactly. So which type of information uh, needs to be exchanged in the United States market um, by basically every uh, party of the supply chain. Um, in DSCSA, it is mentioned uh, the so-called 3T. These are three document types which need to be exchanged. And they are, um, let's say, can be um, split up in the transaction information, TI. Uh, the transaction information contains the name of the product, the strength and dosage, dosage form, the NDC number, the national drug code, the container size, lot number, transaction date, business names. And uh, in, uh, at the end of the year, it will also be extended by the serial number and the uh, lot number and expiry date, sorry. Then the transaction history, TH. Um, this is an electronic or paper record stating all prior transactions, uh, meaning the change of ownership. And uh, to keep in mind, uh, in the United States, it's also uh, on a longer history of the so-called pedigree. And this is uh, in the future going to be extended in, in the way that it's called an e-pedigree. Uh, this is basically a document showing every prior owners of an individual item. And uh, it's really starts always with the manufacturer. And at the pharmacy, you will have a document um, showing for an individual item, uh, the, the last wholesaler or third party logistics company um, going back to the manufacturer. This allows every party in the supply chain to always have uh, full transparency of which way did the product take until it uh, um, ended up where it is now. And last but not least is the transaction statement, TS. This uh, as well is an electronic or paper record stating by um, stating basically that uh, all the entities which uh, are or have been, let's say, in contact with the, the product are authorized under DSCSA, so they are registered. Um, they did not knowingly ship any suspect or illicit product, um, had the systems in place to comply with verification requirements. And basically, this is a kind of uh, a legal disclaimer of uh, the prior owner and the current party who is owning uh, the product to the final customer or final patient. To keep in mind, um, all the records must be kept for at least six years. So it's not possible um, to do that basically paper-based, um, even though the, 
the, the law states in theory it's possible to do that in paper but in in let's say modern times it's it's almost impossible to do that in paper so um, in in general this requires indirectly again that you need to have an electronic system or a database um, which can create all the above mentioned uh, documents last but not least also to keep in mind all these documents must be available in human readable form upon request, meaning that uh, you typically exchange the data in machine readable form, um, but upon request, for example, from a patient or upon request of uh, an authority, for example, FDA is allowed to um, request for an individual suspect product, um, please um, show us the, the TI, the TH, TS. And in this case, um, this information must be um, made available in a human readable form. This can be some kind of printout or um, some formatted document that it can just be printed out. As already mentioned, uh, the TI, um, the transaction information, is until now or currently uh, containing the data elements stated on the left side. Um, so we have uh, all proprietary or established names of the product, um, strengths, dosage, dosage forms. So uh, quite a bunch of uh, kind we call these master data. So uh, general information about the product, container size, number of containers. All this information allows um, somebody in the supply chain to validate that what uh, he's having in his, in his hand is the real product and not in any way tampered or was manipulated. Um, on the right side, you see basically almost all the same information. And I pointed out basically the four informations that are um, directly printed on the product, which is the NDC uh, on the product, typically in form of the global trade item number or GTIN, the lot number of the product, um, as well as new, the serial code and the expiry date. These two um, information bits need to be exchanged with all the trade partners uh, the latest from end of 2023 on. <clears throat> so how is this going or what is basically required by uh, the um, Food and Drug Administration? Um, the law states in section 582 that um, this uh, DSCSA requires a promptly respond with TI and TS upon request by the secretary. Um, in this case, it uh, can be a federal or state official. Um, in typically, it would be the FDA um, or somebody out of um, somewhere else is also allowed to 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 ask um, and. It is the goal to promptly facilitate the gathering the information necessary to produce TI for each transaction going back to the manufacturer. So the person who um, was requested needs to give out these uh, TI documents and basically the transaction history within 24 hours. There are some other timelines stating three days, but typically it's 24 hours. What is uh, the goal that is uh, that needs to be reached um, at the end of 2023? <clears throat> so how can this or how is this uh, going to be achieved? What's the goal um, of, uh, let's say, desired data model, because you can imagine it's it's a lot of information that needs to be exchanged between all the trade partners and all um, parties involved in the supply chain. Um, there are three basic models of communication. Um, the first one is the centralized model. So all trade partners would um, provide their data to a central repository or one big, huge database in this case. Um, this would uh, basically make it relatively clear where you send the data and uh, where you request the data. 
And from there on are two other models. One is the decentralized, the fully decentralized model, meaning every trade partner has their own local database and uh, local storage. And uh, they are themselves re responsible for tracing and tracking all the information to, uh, let's say, um, build all the information of every product that they are um, selling or receive, buying or selling through the supply chain. Um, and last but not least is the semi-centralized. In this case, some trade partners um, or some big trade partners in the case of the United States, um, probably most of you um, have worked one day or another with the three major wholesalers, which are uh, McKesson, Amerisource Bergen, and um, Cardinal Health. Um, some of these big trade partners maintain uh, large databases or very developed databases, and they allow some of the trade partners, some other trade partners in the market to take over some of their responsibilities or to sell these responsibilities. Um, over the past years, um, FDA has uh, uh, evaluated these three types. Um, in for example, most other markets, the centralized model is being applied. For example, in the European Union, there is one central database which is holding all serial codes and the manufacturer needs to upload the data there. And everybody else at, the, let's say, the end of the supply chain um, books out the product as soon as it is being dispensed. In case of the United States, it was decided by FDA that uh, they want to um, preferentially go in the direction of the decentralized or semi-centralized model. Um, so currently the semi-centralized model is um, allowed and meaning that basically everybody in the end is um, allowed to create their own database and um, it's let's say, part of the exercise for um, the manufacturer, as well as everybody else, part of the supply chain, to establish a, a data connection to from the very um, beginning at the manufacturer to the dispenser, um, how the data can be accessed by everybody. So in reality, um, several models are out there which could be used um, or actually start to get um, uh, implemented in the market. Uh, two models I am showing you here are basically um, most widely going to be adopted over the past months. Um, one model is out there which seemed as or is coming out of, let's say, the industry of uh, suppliers as we are. Um, but it seems that these two models, which we are, I'm, I'm going to explain now, um, seem to be preferred solution for the time being. So um, what you see here is uh, two paths of how you can uh, let's say, distribute the data over your supply chain and uh, allow all, let's say, uh, involved parties to have access to the required information. Um, so manufacturer A, um, we start on the, on the center left, uh, creates uh, or let's say prints the data on his uh, product, has a database, uh, for example, Amasino, which is uh, the database we are producing at Highcoff. And um, he sells the product or transfers the product to a wholesaler in the United States. And um, this we would call the full e-pedigree model, uh, the top um, route. And uh, so you would send with your product as well a data set containing all serial codes which have been um, printed on product and the full um, packaging hierarchy which was um, involved uh, to the wholesaler. And uh, you see that with, um, let me show it here. I have the laser pointer. Yeah, you see this here. Um, there is a document being sent over to the wholesaler um, stating basically the past owner who is the manufacturer himself. As soon as the wholesaler from there is going to sell his product to a client or a pharmacy, he will 
add um, his um, his name to the list and we'll send just for the product that he sold to the next uh, person in the supply chain um, a list of the serial codes he sent as well as um, a list with all the previous owners and his own name and it will continue like that at the end um, the final dispenser will have a list which looks like the list on the right uh, starting with the manufacturer the wholesaler and the pharmacy in the end now the bottom route is uh, working differently. Um, in this case, we have, uh, instead of a wholesaler, we have a third party logistics company or 3PL. And uh, for this um, model, we call it the indirect e pedigree model. Um, we have, we sell the, the product to the 3PL, and we have basically. Um, uh, an agreement with him that he will tell us whom he delivered the product afterwards to which client. In this case, um, the 3PL will just tell uh, the manufacturer basically which product was dispensed to whom and the manufacturer can in case of any kind of request uh, create um, the required 3T documents um, upon request. So in this case, the manufacturer is taking over more responsibilities, um, but the 3PL probably will uh, require uh, less um, resources to do this in the future compared to the above model, which is more complex from a systems perspective for the wholesaler, or even if this would be a, a 3PL. A second model, which I mentioned earlier, is the so-called VRS model. Um, this is the so-called uh, verification router service. Um, this is a possibility which was uh, invented uh, based on a standardized exchange protocol between the major, let's say, um, system suppliers on the market for serialization systems that uh, they would allow um, querying based on the GTIN code to find the, the initial manufacturer of a product to automate, automatically query um, for a uh, product in, in question or a uh, product that's, that needs to be clarified um, at the correct database directly. So this is a, a nice idea. It's currently um, partly implemented, but not uh, fully live. And uh, the majority of the market is going in the ways I just mentioned in the previous slide. So how could you now, um, let's say, comply with all these requirements as uh, mentioned earlier or now. Um, and uh, therefore, I would like to give you some insights about the, the software or the tools we can deliver from Hikov site. Uh, as mentioned, we are delivering or we have a, a database a system called Amasina, which is a fully cloud-based solution. Um, it can be used, of course, with machinery, which is coming from us, but it can also be integrated um, with existing um, level three servers. So for example, you are having already uh, um, equipment and um, machinery on site and you would like to use um, uh, an updated software solution we could connect Amasina to uh, your existing level 3 server or in case you have already a level 4 server and you would like to facilitate the interfacing with some of um, the existing partners in the market uh, you can also connect uh, your existing level 4 system through Amasina with uh, the authorities or some other business partners. Amazena is a fully um, cloud native solution, meaning it was uh, initially designed um, to be uh, cloud-based. It's not um, 
it can be on premise uh, uh, delivered, but it's typically a fully cloud based solution. Um, it has a very innovative uh, central architecture based on the principle one single source of truth. So all information required by our machinery is directly um, maintained in one single database. So no possibility for, uh, let's say, replicating data and settings at several points. It's a fully enterprise uh, grade solution, which is GMP valid uh, or GMP, um, let's say compliant. It uh, is G GAM5 validated and uh, used in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, some of the functionalities that we have in Amazena um, as we start on the bottom left. The same software in our case is running at the machinery up to the level five uh, solution. So it's uh, developed in a single core. Um, we have therefore all the components for printers, interface, barcode quality checking, OCR, um, as well as the machine and line controllers in the solution available. Um, you see on the bottom right, we have the infrastructure of uh, the user management, system management, audit trails, everything um, in one solution um, managed. And of course, all the data as already mentioned uh, before, including the production management, interfacing, interface generator, and uh, some management cockpit. Um, as mentioned, we have uh, a lot of interfacing, which is um, available out of the box. We have hundreds of interfaces out of the box available for um, most of the systems out on the market. Uh, we have available um, the interfaces to the uh, all big um, let's say areas of business uh, internationally. So the systems of uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Indonesia, European Union, uh, South Korea, uh, United Arab Emirates, and so on. Um, some neat features which are only available in our solution are we have a fully uh, GMP compliant change uh, management process integrated, meaning that every change uh, can be controlled by two persons. So the first person creates the change and the second person needs to approve the change. Um, this allows uh, a paperless uh, process for uh, uh, change control, which uh, saves you here and there a lot of money in uh, in processes. As mentioned earlier, um, our solution is a, a single core solution. We don't have uh, typically in our own um, machinery interfaces to machineries um, available or required. This makes it um, much easier to connect the individual equipment together compared to other solutions on the market. Therefore, we also have uh, one database source for all information required along the process chain, making it uh, very easy to make changes and keep the data uh, correct, which is related to serialization. Um, <clears throat> Compared to other solutions, you often have uh, uh, processes where you need to replicate data on a machine, then on the level three server and the level four server. In our solution, everything is coming out of one database, making it um, simple and easy. You can think of your iPhone. As soon as you delete the contact you have in your Macintosh computer, the contact is well deleted. And it's the same in our solution. Continuing from there, um, as we have the machine as well as uh, all connected systems coming out of one company, we um, have the possibility to have one single uh, support for everything. This makes it much easier and faster to resolve issues, um, which is typically well um, received by our customers. Um, oftentimes, uh, systems uh, with multiple suppliers uh, lack the feature of finding the issue fast enough and then it could even end up in a kind of a ping pong between the suppliers who who is responsible to solve the issue and uh, this is often not very pleasing experience for the customers. 
So another feature we can offer is uh, Amasina WP, um, or we call it's a abbreviation for the workflow processor. And uh, what we do with that is we automate basically the workflows which can happen. Um, so as you know, or as you might uh, have already experienced, within uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing as a contract manufacturer or, or as a manufacturer at all, uh, you never have the same process for all your customers. It's often very customer specific and therefore uh, it's very error prone if you do all the processes manually. Um, at Masino, we have uh, an extension module, which is a very nice solution. You are allowed to click together. Um, uh, you see that here it's a table-based generator where you click together um, operations which uh, need to be um, taken place one after another for a certain product or a certain customer. And these workflows can always run through. They can be triggered by internal or external, um, uh, let's say, uh, gates. For example, you need to answer an email or set, press somewhere OK or um, confirm something. And based on that, the, the process will continue. This is a sample process, uh, how this could look or how this uh, could help. For example, here, um, a customer needs uh, to manually receive uh, or manually needs to import some serial codes. And uh, this um, is being um, uh, triggered by an email, which is sent out to the market authorization holder. And uh, from there, the serial codes are being requested. And such a process, for example, which often runs manually on the background, in this case could be automated by the system that the system sends out the, the request for serial codes instead of somebody is doing that manually. Some of the advantages uh, which come with that, of course, complexity is moved uh, away from your process and uh, putting into a validated system uh, fully, um, uh, let's say also um, validatable by, by a third party. Um, you have high flexibility as these um, processes can be triggered on and off individually for every product or every um, customer. It's not, uh, let's say, one size fits all solution and it makes it also easy to integrate such solution in an existing environment where you have uh, maybe not that much um, uh, time to make a, a very big loop. Some validation. Um, we have, of course, a fully validated setup and uh, we can deliver all required validation documents if that is uh, of interest for you, of course. Uh, maybe some words about the machinery we can deliver to fulfill um, requirements. We have a full range of uh, marking equipment um, for high speeds uh, to very high speeds for flat carton as well um, with various printing quality um, requirements. We can deliver um, very flexible machinery or very fast machinery. So um, maybe to the Amacoder machine, which is uh, running with a very unique principle. Typically, most machinery on the market is running conveyor based. And from the very left uh, on this drawing, you see the standard machinery, which we can also deliver. It's a standard conveyor where you have the product, uh, let's say, passing by the printer. Uh, but the problem with that is that you don't have controlled box movement, which uh, is typically not too good for your printing quality. Therefore, um, are more complex machinery available, which we can also deliver with flighted conveyors. Um, this uh, it, uh, makes the, the box alignment better and also the print quality. The Amacoder machinery is, uh, is unique. It's on the far right. It's a pusher-based system. So we push the box through the, the machinery, which uh, gives a very high uh, control in, uh, let's say, mechanical uh, box movement, very high print quality, and typically a low overall cost of the process. Uh, some features we have on our own machinery, of course, the print and camera layouts are fully created on the cloud um, at, let's say, an office level. So nobody needs to manage the printers and camera settings at the 
at the factory or shop floor. Everything can happen at the uh, artwork department and being validated there before it's being sent with the, the order to the machinery. From there, the, the printer as well as the cameras are automatically set up to control everything according to the, the master settings. We have a, a single source of um, all, let's say, design elements of the software, making it easy for everybody involved to quickly, um, let's say, get started in the software and to work through all um, interfaces as they all look very similar and follow the same design um, principles. Therefore, it's, it's easy to learn and uh, to get uh, involved into the solution. Um, now we have also some integration kits. If you have an existing machinery and printers, um, we can um, de integrate into the existing machinery um, by replacing existing cameras and printers and putting in new HICOF um, designed um, controllers and uh, uh, cameras, which makes it easy to fully integrate with the Amasina software. This is also available for labeling machinery. Uh, I'm sure Mike uh, wants to go back to that. Uh, of course, you're fully integratable into the Newman equipment, which makes it um, uh, an, an, a very good um, extension. And last but not least, we have also some aggregation uh, equipment. So we can integrate into existing um, machinery. And as already mentioned, building the hierarchy, we have a full set of um, machinery which allows to create these aggregation structures from fully manual on the left to uh, semi-automated case packers for high speeds um, and at, let's say, um, good price ranges uh, for such a type of machinery. Okay, that was uh, my part of uh, uh, the presentation. I um, hope uh, I shed a lot of light on many of your questions and uh, I think I am give back to Mike. Thank you so much, Sasha. I really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Newman. We have a full range of labelers, but also can do tamper evident labeling on uh, your uh, cartons. Uh, let's see, I think I need to advance here. I'm not sure that I've got it, but the next slide. Anyway, um, we certainly are available. Get in touch with us if you want us to come in and help do uh, gap analysis, if you want to look at upgrade feasibility. Certainly, if you're considering new uh, equipment for your serialization plans, let us know. We're happy to help. Uh, and finally, I think uh, we would like to discuss any questions that have come up. Great. Another question that have arrived is, what have been some of the lessons learned when trying to integrate and upgrade competitor solutions on your client's production lines? Um, well, definitely some, some lessons learned from our side uh, are um, before integrating into any existing uh, equipment at a, a customer, it's uh, very important to get the firsthand uh, look and feel of the existing e equipment um, to specify exactly what customer needs and how a, a project could be um, uh, lined out before, let's say, uh, equipment is ordered and uh, at, at site, because uh, as soon as equipment is on site, you cannot do much. And typically, it's very important. Um, I mentioned that quickly in the presentation, but um, the marking of uh, folding boxes is very um, demanding, mainly in um, control of the box or of the product itself. So the printing systems are uh, printing with 300 dpi to fulfill most of the requirements and um, 300 dpi printing is uh, is just compared to let's say the the more traditional continuous inkjet printers and uh, we use um, high resolutions AP, hp printing systems 
and um, it, it, they just are more sensitive on, um, let's say, mechanical uh, stress uh, or mechanical um, vibrations coming from the box or the machinery itself. Therefore, it's, it's, it's very important to uh, look into the, let's say, the existing machine frame that's at the customer uh, before we, we integrate. Uh, but um, when you get in contact with Mike, um, he will take care of that and uh, will prepare all that so we can propose the best possible solution to, uh, to your. Certainly look forward to the opportunity to do that. Uh, Sasha, we also have another question that just arrived, and it is, what are the steps required to assess the feasibility adding serial serialization to existing packaging machines? Um, well, basically, it's, it's following the same what I just yeah. mentioned. Um, we need to uh, get into uh, contact with the customer, see what the machinery, uh, how it is built like, uh, what, what is the ideal position to integrate um, uh, printers and cameras. Um, is it possible, basically, overall, or which risks are involved by integrating? Because, of course, uh, retrofitting existing equipment is always um, coming with some risks and we are happy to help customers uh, with the experience we made um, based on on our 20 years of uh, being in that business wonderful that's all that i have in the chat if anybody has any additional questions we'll hang in for a minute let me know Okay, well, let me thank you all very much for attending and certainly hi cop. Thank you very much for the prep and involvement and doing a wonderful presentation. I hope everybody has a great holiday remains healthy and um, was looking forward to a new <laughs> healthy and happy new year. So thank you all very much. Most appreciated. Thank Have you very one. much also from my side uh, for the opportunity and your um, attendance here on the call. It was my great pleasure and uh, looking forward to get in contact uh, with everybody who is interested.